Well, greetings and welcome to the part two video in the Build Your Own Trema Drive video series. Uh, in this installment, we're going to take a look at the wiring diagram and schematic for the unit and discuss uh, the disparities between them and how you can resolve them and also just certain details that you should pay attention to while you're building your own unit. Then we'll take a look at the uh, Trema drive that I built years ago and see how I approached uh, some of the challenges of construction. I don't mean to limit you to using the same methods I use, but if you're at a total loss on how to proceed, maybe seeing how I built mine will give you uh, some sort of tips or pointers to head you in the right direction. I have no doubt that some of you out there in YouTube land will be able to build a better unit than I did. Uh, recall this was my first venture into uh, guitar electronics and uh, at least cosmetically I think mine leaves uh, something to be desired. So uh, this will give you something to aim for. Um, if you can outdo me, great. Be sure that you post pictures on my uh, Facebook page showing us uh, how your Trema drive turned out. Let's discuss some of the differences between the schematic and the wiring diagram to avoid any confusion uh, while you're starting to construct your own version of, of this circuit. In the schematic, uh, he runs his power input uh, to the fuse first, uh, then the on-off switch, and then the primary of the power transformer. Whereas in the uh, wiring diagram, the black wire, which is the hot wire from the three-wire input cord, goes first to the switch, then the fuse, and then the transformer primary winding. People have different opinions about this, but I agree with this version because then when you switch it off, it is completely off. The fuse is not still activated. Uh, next, at nowhere in the schematic or the wiring diagram uh, is the current uh, capability of these transformers ever really stated. Now, I looked at pictures of one of his original units and he uses 200 milliamp transformers. In my version, I used 450 milliamp uh, transformers. Whereas in my video series, parts one through four, I showed much higher uh, current uh, transformers, uh, like 1.2 amps and 3 amps, as I recall. Well, you don't need that type of current capability. You can get by with 200 to 450 milliamp transformers, which are much cheaper than the higher current transformers that I showed you in parts one through four. In the voltage doubler portion of the wiring diagram, I see no uh, significant differences between it and the schematic. Uh, notice also that he suggests using terminal strips the same that, that I tend to use also. I prefer this method uh, for point-to-point -point wiring. One other observation is he's suggesting a 120 volt pilot lamp across the primary of the first transformer. Um, this is usually a neon bulb pilot lamp. If you don't have any of those, you can always wire a 12 volt pilot lamp, which is much more common, across these two terminals down here, which would be the secondary output from that transformer, which will be 12 volts for the 12 volt pilot lamp. These are the same lugs that you'll use for your filament voltage for the 12AX7. Now, looking at the wiring diagram for the Trema drive circuit itself, we notice the use of shielding on the wires from the input all the way up to the grid of the tube, and I think this is a, an excellent idea. You ground the shielding of these wires in one place. In other words, you don't ground both ends of the shielded wire. You only ground it on one end. That will cut down on the possibility of ground loops, uh, which is another topic you could look up on Google. 
but uh, using the shielded wire will cut down on any electromagnetic interference or hum or input of noise into our signal uh, in its very early stages when it is most susceptible to this type of interference. For those not accustomed to how tube sockets are numbered, imagine that we're looking from underneath at the tube socket where it's wired. The tube, in other words, is pointing away from us. Okay, now uh, you notice this gap between these terminals here. We'll start just to the right or clockwise of that gap, and that will be pin number one, and then going clockwise, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this is the way all tube sockets are numbered. Uh, we recall that in the schematic, he shows a ungrounded output to the amp, but in the wiring diagram there is a grounded output. I would say that you do not need the grounded output to the amp, so I would use a different type of output jack. And other than that, uh, I don't see much else to comment on. Uh, he is using terminal strips, as I prefer for my point-to-point -point wiring, and I would suggest uh, to beginners or people who have not already established their own methods for point-to-point -point wiring that it terminal uh, strips like this really work well. Pay attention also to whether the pots are linear or audio tapered. Audio tapered pots use a logarithmic taper. It is not a straight line. The linear pots, as the name would imply, use a straight line taper. If you notice the depth pot is linear, the drive pot is audio or logarithmic taper, and the speed is a linear pot. Well that's about it then on the schematic and wiring diagram review. Uh, let's take a look at the unit that I built years ago and see how it uh, complies with these diagrams. Here we see that Rusty's nose has some mud on it because he's been burying bones again. In response to inquiries about how to build a safe electrolytic capacitor discharge tool, I thought I'd take a few seconds here to show you how I built mine. First you need an old insulated handle screwdriver either Phillips or straight bladed, uh, and then grind the end to a point. Then you will take a 100 ohm 10 watt resistor, you can place it right here on the blade of the screwdriver, wrap this lead of the resistor around the end of the screwdriver and solder it to the metal. To the other end you're going to solder a piece of regular wire about a foot to 18 inches long. Then attach an alligator clip to the other end of the wire, the one that's not connected to the 100 ohm resistor. Wrap the resistor and the handle of the screwdriver with black electrical tape and you will have a capacitor discharging tool just like mine. Okay, let's see how to use the tool. We know that to one end, usually the negative end of electrolytic capacitors is grounded to the chassis. This end, in this case, you notice the pinched end on tubular capacitors is always the positive end. In the can, the outside is negative, and these tabs here will be used to ground it. So we'll clip on to the chassis, which will be the negative end of the capacitor, and then we will touch each of the positive lugs of the capacitor and hold contact for about five or six seconds to allow the capacitor to fully discharge. With the tubular capacitor it's just the same. We connect to the chassis which is the negative grounded end of the electrolytic and we'll touch the positive end with our contact, our probe, uh, and hold for about five seconds. If you do this uh, you can be about well, close to 100% sure that the electrolytic capacitors are fully discharged. If you really want to double check to make sure that the capacitors are fully discharged, use your DC voltmeter, hook the black or negative lead onto the chassis uh, where the negative end of the capacitor is grounded, 
and I'll hook the other end onto the positive uh, end of the capacitor and see if you get any sort of meaningful reading above background noise. Uh, if it shows 10 volts or 100 volts, then you know it is not fully discharged. Everybody's always telling me to give you a rub or a pat for them, Rusty. So here they, here they are. Here's all the love from your the viewers. Oh, time to eat. Okay, let's take a look at the unit that I built uh, several years ago. As you can see, the front's rather plain. I used just typed on paper and cut out and glued on labels for each of the controls. Nothing particularly elegant. Uh, you'll see a mixture of knobs here. Uh, it's just what I had in the drawer. Also, I'll go into some detail in just a second about where I got the jacks and the on-off switch and other components. I drilled a few holes in the top so that the tube heat could escape. And then on the back, I have my overdrive volume control, again with another type of knob, the uh, three-wire power cord, and the strain relief, and then the fuse holder. I know you'll get a good laugh out of the rubber feet. I didn't have any handy, and I didn't want to screw holes in the metal to attach them. So I just used some rubber weather stripping material and glued two strips of it to the bottom, which makes a really nice soft contact wherever you choose to set this unit down. Now let's remove these sheet metal screws and take a look inside. Okay, the screws are removed and the cover slips off. Now you're going to laugh again when I tell you where this came from. It's an old piece of galvanized sheet metal that I had left over from making irrigation canal uh, shutoffs. Um, I just bent it in the vise using 2x4s um, to secure the edges and fold it over like I did in my Supro video and then drill some holes in the top here for uh, a heat vent and then four screw holes so that I could secure it to the chassis. The chassis is the typical C-shaped metal box uh, open on the sides and on the top which is what necessitated that metal uh, cover that I made to enclose all of the components and the electrical shock hazard within. Now just a brief little history of where this uh, chassis came from. Uh, several years ago I was at the Guitar Center and they had a little solid state Electar style of amplifier that uh, was completely fried internally. But I like the cabinet and I really like this aluminum grill that was on the front. So I bought it for, as I recall, like $20 from them. I had no plans uh, for making a Tremo Boost. Really, uh, what I was looking for was the uh, parts here of the cabinet and the grill and the knobs and things like that. So what I did is I used a table saw and I cut off about two inches back here on the front part of the amp. So I got the grill cloth and this uh, Electar grill all attached with the Electar nameplate, but it was only, say, an inch and a half thick. Then I drilled right in the center, put a little quartz uh, clock movement in there, put a couple numbers out here on the grill cloth, uh, and then sold it to another guitar shop for $65. So, right off the bat, I've got about four, $45 in my pocket, and I've got all the rest of the parts of this amplifier, including the metal chassis. Later, when I wanted to make the Tremo Boost, I dragged out the chassis, which was longer. It, it came over about to here. So uh, I figured out my layout in here and then used a bandsaw and cut off that much of the chassis. So that's where this came from. I got the chassis, I got the power switch, the input jacks on the back, I got the uh, three wire power cord, the strain relief, and the fuse holder, uh, and what, $45 in my pocket. So pretty good deal so far. I then went to Radio Shack and bought two transformers. These are 450 milliamps each. As I said uh, earlier in the video, you really only need about 200 each. But that's all they had, so I took the 450s. I think these are like $5.99 a piece at the time. I used a terminal strip down here to make all my electrical connections for the primary uh, circuit. Uh, so my power supply is located here. And up here are my uh, filter capacitors for the power supply. And everything else, as far away as I could get it from my signal 
uh, wires that are up here at the front. I had to put the boost uh, potentiometer at the rear because I simply did not have any room in the front panel. Uh, I drilled holes and relocated some of the controls to where they were kind of evenly dispersed over the front of the panel uh, and I installed the pots and jacks and everything else uh, before I started wiring. Sadly there wasn't enough room to have the 12AX7 be vertically mounted so I made a little metal stand and horizontally mounted it which with 12AX7's works just fine. And that's why there are holes up here in the metal cover to let the heat uh, escape. I used terminal strips here, here, up here at the front, and over here, uh, wherever I decided that they would be most useful. And that way they secure your components so they're not flapping around. I happen to have a little 120 volt neon uh, pilot light, so I included it in the primary uh, circuit of the transformer. If you uh, really, if you want to use a 12 volt pilot light, you can, as I showed you in the uh, opening scenes from this uh, video. So you can see the pots and uh, switches and all are fairly neatly installed. And uh, I use the uh, shielded cable wherever there are runs, like here and here, of signal carrying wire through uh, electrical fields, which are pretty much inescapable in a small chassis like this. Also, since I didn't have the proper switch on hand to do the uh, bypass boost selection, I used a sliding switch, which works just fine. It's just not real pretty. And I consolidated my on-off switch and my tremolo speed. If you listen, that turns on the tremolo, that click that you hear, and then this becomes the speed control, which saved me having to drill two holes, toggle switch on off and speed control, and allow only one hole uh, and one component to serve two functions. Okay, uh, I think that's about it for this tour of the interior. I'll do a real slow pan so that you can if I get to an area of interest, you can stop the video and take a look at how this was done. As I said, I urge you to deviate from uh, my methods here and uh, get creative. Come up with something new for yourself. Also, if you don't have a metal chassis pan handy and you don't really feel up to making bends like this in metal, let me make another suggestion for you and what to use as a chassis. If you go over to Hobby Lobby or some other hobby craft store, they have all sorts of metal boxes like this that you could use to enclose your uh, tremolo drive. Um, of the box. Also they have all sorts of decorative boxes. I mean this is uh, not exactly my cup of tea right here but uh, they have all sorts of different boxes you can use and they don't necessarily have to be metal. In this case this one I think is uh, almost like a, a cigar box material. In fact cigar boxes would work pretty well too uh, if you wanted. So there's no end of possibilities uh, for your chassis uh, source. Well, that's about it in this part two video of a two-part series in which we build our own uh, Richtone Trema Drive effects unit. I hope that the explanations were clear and helpful. And for you first-timers, that you will be very, very careful while you're building this unit. Please heed all of the safety warnings. As I said in part one, the last thing that you want to do while working on your first electronics project is to find out what electrocution feels like. So whether you choose to actually build your own unit or just look at this as a learning exercise, I uh, appreciate your time and interest, and I hope you will join Rusty and me in our next video to be released soon. So stay tuned. Looks like there's a storm brewing out here in the desert. Of course, all of this can clear up in the next 10 minutes or so. 
But for now, it looks like we might get some rain. It looks like in an effort to keep from falling off the cliff, this bush sent out one root to hold itself up. And here comes a freight train. Coming around the bend. looks like a fossilized egg. Well, it looks like somebody's getting some heavy rain back toward town. And of course, as it is in the desert, there's blue skies above me. Every time I drop by this place, I think to myself, hmm, not bad. Kind of small on the square footage, but great security.